Okay, I want to motivate the notions of divergence and curl by drawing a couple two-dimensional vector fields and seeing how they're both measured. So um, let me, oops. Okay, so let me draw a vector field that is sort of rotating about a point. Okay, so here's enough vectors to sort of give you the idea that maybe this vector field represents some sort of fluid flow or something. And I'm focusing, I'm focusing my attention on this point right here, and it appears that the flow is sort of circling around that point. Let me take a look at the following quantities. So if this vector field is given by the component functions m and n, let me study the rate of change of the n component of the vector field in the direction of x and the rate of change of the m component of the vector field in the direction of y at this point right here. Okay, so to measure dn dx, what I'm going to do is I'm going to move in the direction of the x variable that's like this. And I'm going to see how is the n changing. So the n is the y component of the vector field. So it will be the um, lengths of the vector in the direction of the y-axis. That's what n is. So if I start here and I move to the right, so I change the x, then take a look at the n components of these vectors. The vectors are getting longer in the direction of the y-axis, right? And um, since they're pointing downwards, that n component is getting more and more and more negative, right? So I think that dn dx should be a negative number. And now let's study dm dy. So what I want to do to study this is I want to move in the direction of the y-axis away from the point, like this, and I want to study how the m is changing. So m is the x component of the vectors of the vector field. So that would be the, um, uh, you know, the x, yeah, the x components of those vectors, the horizontal components of those vectors. Okay, so start at this point, and we're going to move in the direction of the y-axis like this, and take a look at the vectors. Their x components seem to be getting bigger, right? Their y components aren't changing at all, but the horizontal length of the vectors are increasing. So the x values, the m, is getting bigger as I move in the direction of the positive y-axis. So I think that this value right here is positive. So in this particular example that I cooked up, this appears to be a negative number, this appears to be a positive number, and if I subtracted these two quantities, I would guarantee to, be, to get then a negative number, right? dn dx is already negative and I'm subtracting off a positive quantity, that gives me a negative value. This expression right here, dn dx minus dm dy, measures exactly that. It measures rotation of uh, a vector field about a point. And this negative number that I'm getting is detecting clockwise rotation around this point. Counterclockwise is considered positive rotation. It's sort of like a right-hand rule type thing. And clockwise rotation is considered negative. So the reason that I'm getting um, this negative value is because I see this clockwise spinning in my vector field. Uh, this, is, this also is something you may recognize from Green's theorem. This quantity um, is present in Green's theorem in the double integral. Uh, I'll review that uh, at the end of this lecture. Um, but anyway, curl is something that we're going to be measuring in vector fields. Uh, let's move on to divergence now. And again, I want to just cook up a little picture quickly. Okay, so I'm focusing my attention on a point here. And I'm trying to describe how the vector field m comma n is behaving at this point. So let me consider two different quantities this time. I'm going to look at the partial of m with respect to x. How is the m component changing as I move in the direction of the x-axis? And d dn dy, how is the n component of the vector field changing as I move in the direction of y?
Okay, so for dm dx, I start at the point and I move in the direction of the x-axis and I say, how are the x components of the vector field changing? As I move to the right, you can see the vectors are getting longer in the horizontal direction. So that's a positive change as far as the x component is concerned. And if I move in the direction of the y-axis and ask about how the n is changing, n is the um, y component of each of these vectors, I see that the y component is getting bigger as I move in the direction of the y, positive y axis. So again, I'm getting a positive number for that as well. And if I add those two positive numbers together, I'm guaranteed to get a positive number. And what this is actually measuring is something that's called divergence. It's the tendency of the, you can imagine um, a fluid flow vector field, um, it's the tendency of that field, that fluid, to uh, diverge from a point. So I see these vectors all sort of going out from that point. That's a positive divergence for the vector field at that point. If all the vectors were pointing in to that point, that would be a negative divergence. And again, you may recognize this quantity as appearing in the second form of Green's theorem. And again, I will review uh, what Green's theorem is saying about curl and divergence at the end of the lecture. Okay, so I've motivated the um, idea of curl and divergence. It turns out that curl and divergence are defined for three-dimensional vector fields as well. And so I want to write down the formal definitions of these things and show you uh, how the, the uh, 2D quantities appeared uh, on the previous page. So curl for a three-dimensional vector field is defined to be the following uh, quantity. It's a vector. It's a vector quantity that captures the different partial derivatives of the component functions of f. And what it does, it's not really apparent from the, from the expression here, but it captures rotation um, of a vector field um, about points in three dimensions. It is a vector quantity, so um, the, the curl is a new vector field giving information of both magnitude and direction. The magnitude of the curl is going to be like the velocity of the rotation. But what does rotation mean sort of in three dimensions? You need an axis around um, which the vector field is rotating. And that's what the direction vector tells you. So you imagine that the direction of this curl vector is pointing at the axis. I mean, it, that, that um, vector is acting like the axis. And it points in the direction of rotation sort of according to the right-hand rule. So it's going to point in the direction of your thumb, and the rotation is occurring in the direction that your fingers curl. So the direction is the axis of rotation. And just think of the right-hand rule when you, when you think about that axis. So the curl vector might be pointing in this direction. What that's giving you is rotation around um, the vector field is going to rotate around the, the axis like that. Okay, um, so why do we call it, this is called nabla cross f, or del cross f. Um, here's a justification. We can think of this nabla, which we've, we've seen in gradients, right? Here's a little reminder of where that symbol has come up before. Um, remember what the nabla um, expression was sort of doing to uh, the multivariate function f to compute the gradient. It was taking the partial derivative with respect to x and putting it into the i component, the partial with respect to y in the j component, and the partial with respect to z in the k component. So if you take the, the nabla operator as a vector itself, a sort of vector of partial derivative, this looks a little weird because, like, Partial with respect to x isn't a number, but if I just put it in the i placeholder, then if I perform this cross product here, I get exactly the expression for curl. So, like, this is really hard to memorize right here, how all of these partials are mixed, but it's not hard to remember that curl is del cross f. So let me just run through that computation to see that it gets us what we want. So if you take your vector field f, that has component functions m, n, and p, to perform the cross product, I want you to imagine it looking like this. 
Just as you would usually take a cross product, you fill a little matrix with i, j, and k. And I'm going to imagine del as like a vector in its own right. Okay, and we perform the, we perform the cross product. So when, we, when we're performing this cross product, we're not actually taking a multiplication here. We're imagine, for example, when we take ddy against p, that is the derivative of p with respect to y. Okay, and we're getting exactly the same expression that I had written out longhand. So this is how we're going to remember um, the computation of curl for uh, 3D vector fields. We're going to take this del operator and cross it with the vector field. And it gives us a new vector. Of course, cross product gives us a vector. That vector field captures the speed of rotation of the vector field or along a, a specified axis. Um, let me just really quickly uh, recover the two-dimensional situation. Remember we had uh, partial n partial x minus partial m partial y as the measure of curl for a 2D vector field. And that does make sense here if we imagine a 2D vector field as being a 3D vector field with a z component of zero. So imagine the xy plane here and you've got your vectors and all that. These are two-dimensional vectors, they just have an m and an n component, but you can just tack on a zero z component for the p of the vector field. So we imagine a 2D vector field as m, n, comma, zero, all right? And if we compute del cross f for a 2D vector field like this, then the p is simply going to be zero, and the m and the n are only going to depend on x's and y's, right? Because there's no z component. So when we go to compute this, dp dy is going to be 0 because p is 0. dn dz, that's the partial of n with respect to z. Well, there is no z in the n function, so that's 0 as well. It, I mean, n is constant with respect to z. And then both of these quantities are going to be 0. And then we're just left with this component here. So the curl in the 2D situation, I guess I'll draw it in green again, ends up being... 0, 0, and then partial n, partial x, minus partial m, partial y. And so we're thinking of the curl of this vector field as shooting straight up, right? You can see this vector only has a z component, so it's either like going up from the um, xy plane or going down from the xy plane, so it's in the direction of the z-axis in any case, and so that makes the z-axis the axis of rotation, and the amount of rotation that we see is this dn dx minus dm dy, which is exactly the quantity of curl we described in the previous page. So this definition of curl is consistent with the uh, two-dimensional curl that we derived on the previous page. Okay, let me now do um, the proper definition of divergence. Divergence is similarly expressed in terms of this del operator, and um, it ends up being the partial of m with respect to x plus n with respect to y plus p with respect to z. Notice that this is a scalar quantity. This is not a vector quantity like curl. So this just gives the um, sort of tendency of the vector field to flow away from a point. And again, the justification of this notation right here is that this looks like a dot product of the vector field with this sort of um, nabla operator, which is a, a, a vector of partial derivatives. So let's just see that. So if I pretend that this is a vector, it's not a vector of numbers, it's a vector of uh, you know, derivative operators, and I dot it with the vector field mnp, then look what I get. And that's exactly the divergence. And in the two-dimensional vector field case, the only difference is your p component is zero, and we're getting exactly the divergence that uh, we had on the previous page.